Thank you for joining us for another edition of Chicano Music Chronicles with Mark Guerrero. Mark Guerrero is a singer-songwriter and recording artist who's been making music since he was a teenager in East Los Angeles in the 60s as part of what has become known as the East Side Sound. He's the son of the late great father of Chicano music, Lalo Guerrero. Mark Guerrero, who has a degree in Chicano studies from Cal State Los Angeles, is dedicated to preserving the rich cultural heritage of Chicano music. And now, here's Mark Guerrero. The focus of this edition of Chicano Music Chronicles is Pat Vegas, bassist, singer, songwriter, and founding member of Redbone. In the early 70s, Redbone released six albums on Epic Records and scored two national top 40 hits, including their mega hit, Come and Get Your Love. Before I talk with Pat, let's check out one of the first things Redbone recorded, Crazy Cajun Cakewalk Band. So, Pat Redbone Vegas, how you doing, man? Okay, man. How's it going, Mark? Really good. Well, we just heard your song, a Crazy Cajun Cakewalk Band. Yeah. And it was written by you, Lolly, and Jay Ford. Tell me about yeah. Jay Ford. Jim Ford's a songwriter that, we, that Lolly and I, when we first moved to L.A., ran into Jim. You know, we, we became friends, real close friends. And uh, he wasn't really a writer at the time, but as he hung out with us, he started playing guitar and, 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 and writing and and before you knew it, he, he's writing for Bobby Womack and all these different artists. He was a great lyricist. I know he wrote a few other songs with you later on, but we'll get into that later. But um, before you were called Redbone, your band was called Crazy Cajun Cakewalk Band, right? Yeah, yeah, we were, yeah. What came first, the name of the band or the song? Uh, the song came first. Okay, and what gave you the idea for it? The Crazy Cajun Cakewalk Band. Was, huh. See, there was no such thing as Cajun music. There never was. It, it was always called Zydeco. Right. Zydeco music. So um, Lolly and I are, are the ones that tagged it, crazy, uh, Cajun music. Uh-huh. We call our style of music that we were doing at the time Cajun rock. Because uh, all my leeches back in the 1960s, all the way back there, uh, I was having all my leeches made. And uh, Crazy Cajun had it made me on the side. It says, medium Cajun rock beat. Yeah. And that was the first time that's ever been said. You Because know, the guy that was writing the cheap music said, what is this? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. I said, I said, Cajun, you know, Louisiana funk, you know. And then, of course, later on came a Creed and Clearwater who opened for us at PJ's. We were working at PJ's three sets a night. And the opening band that was opening that doing the first show for us was a band called uh, uh, Willie and the Poor Boys, oh. and which later on became Creed and Clearwater. But they heard our set. We did it every night, and they were it for months. And that thing I heard was Creedence Clearwater, you know, and uh, see, all their Cajun music had the same changes as our songs. It's, that's what's so peculiar and funny. It had the same changes, you know what I'm saying? But a different melody. They later came out with Born on the Bayou and a lot of their swampy Cajun stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, man. So you, you started calling the band that, right? The crazy Cajun cakewalk band. See, Nicky Hokey was the first Cajun song out there that Lolly and I wrote with Jim. It was called Nicky Hokey, you know, and, and that was the first one out. With P.J. Proby, it was a top five hit, and then the Richard Franklin cut it right. on the album of Lady Soul. We're going to play that in a couple of songs. Okay. Uh, but for now, I want to ask you, um, the original Crazy Cajun Cakewalk Band had Pete DePoe, right? And you and your brother, That's right. Tony Bellamy, already? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that was the original first band with P.J. It was, I mean, the Peter DePoe. And so that song, talk <laughs> about the song. It's very... Interesting, uh, like there's no drums on a lot of it. In fact, the drums yeah. don't come in for a while, but it's got yeah. this funky, slow groove, and you're singing with your voice with a little edge to it, a little raspiness, which sounds really cool. CBS signed us on the basis of that song. They wanted more of that. Oh. And uh, when we got together in the studio, they didn't know that Lolly was a writer, Tony was a writer, everybody was writing, right? Uh-huh. So, uh, so we went off into another kind of realm we would and we were in the Cajun Swamp Band music but also we were going to other directions you know uh-huh. so it kind of sw- swung a little bit away from uh, Crazy Cajun you know so you didn't actually record any records under that name right under Crazy Cajun Cakewalk Band mm-hmm. yeah we did oh, we, you did? we had four sides cut oh cool what were they and those are the ones that got us the deal over CBS. oh okay got it it was Crazy Cajun Cakewalk Band uh, Handle It 
and three strike rhythm with the King Kong beat, and uh, what else? Uh, can't remember the other one. Were they actually released or were they just demos? No, they actually came out on, on the first album. They're part of the first album. Right, but that was under the name Redbone, though, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so they weren't released as the Crazy Cajun Cakewalk. Then. No. Okay. When Clive Davis uh, agreed to sign us, Larry Cohen came up to the house where we were rehearsing and uh, heard us and said, yeah, we went, so I went to my office at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So we showed up there, and everybody had a name. So we figured the band had agreed that whoever came up with the name that the group used, that the label wanted, they would own the name. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh, uh-huh. So uh, Lolly came up with uh, Crazy Cajun Cape Walk Band. Uh, Tony came up with uh, some other name, and then uh, everybody came up with a name. But at the end, at the last one, I pulled out the paper that I had in my pocket about five or six years. A little piece of paper, about the size of a, of a, I don't know, a stamp. And on it was written the name Redbone. Uh-huh. And I handed that to the girl at the, the typewriter filling up the contract. And she said, Redbone. And she paused for a minute. Everybody nodded their head, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, because like, everybody explained what their name was. Now, Tony's name was Tobias, and uh, Peter had something else. And uh, when I told him what Redbone meant, that was it. Great, great name. You know, that it meant half-breed. Anyone that had Indian blood in them was a uh, Redbone. Instead of calling him a half-breed yeah. or a redskin, you know, it's a Redbone. Great name. Worked out. Yeah. Let's talk about the drums on that. I found them very unusual because they don't appear for a while. Then they disappear and they come in, they come out, they come in. And it's a strange kind of groove he's playing that almost doesn't fit with the music. And that was the style, though. That was the style that we had developed, you know, mm-hmm. that we worked out where it was like broken up and, you know, and it's like that. Remember when you're sitting down jamming, right? Yeah. At home with your friends and you guys are playing. Yeah. It drops in and drops out and right. comes back in. That's the kind of feel we wanted to get. Well, you definitely got it. Your vocal is really interesting. That's my voice that I wanted to do the entire album like that, but nobody agrees. <laughs> that's why I got one shot at it. That's it. But I'm still singing like this anyway. Oh, yeah. I noticed that you're know, hearing a lot of your stuff recently. Yeah. And there were a couple other songs in the future that you used that little raspy sound on. Yeah, I wanted to That's my sound. That's the sound that I think is magic, but uh, I didn't get enough time to use it. Yeah, yeah. So the next song we're going to play is Prehistoric Rhythm, yeah. and uh, that was on the Redbone album, the first album in 1970, and uh, that's the one with the King Kong beat, right? That's right. That's what we called it, the Prehistoric Rhythm with the King Kong beat. Because the Prehistoric Rhythm was a rhythmic thing that Tony and I and Ali got into, and Pete, so we called it King Kong beat, but the rhythm, that Prehistoric Rhythm, you know, that, you know, when we lock in to the rhythm... It lifts off the ground and starts to take up. So what happens is the one is no longer there. It's everywhere. <laughs> so the one is constantly moving, you know. So mm-hmm. we're, now we're not going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. See, the, we hit that, when we hit that stride and we go, we're on it, the one begins to move. You know what I'm saying? And the one could be anywhere, but, but we never lost it. And that was the trip about our rhythm, the King Kong beat funny thing is we'd be on stage in front of about 50,000 people and all of a sudden we'd be going, we'd go off into one of these rhythms and then like the clock would bam, with a hit of the snare we were all back on time on the one. <laughs> so the uh, King Kong beat went well with the prehistoric rhythm. Oh, absolutely. Wow. I always loved that song and you know my friends recorded it and I know you know them, you know the group Elijah. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, they did a very nice version on their uh, United Artists album in 1972. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And how did you meet Elijah? Do you remember? They came to the club where we were working. Mm-hmm. They came over to see us, the Red Velvet, remember? Yeah, yeah. And um, they came for one of the jams one night and said that they were recording uh, some of our songs and, and invited us to the session. So we just got together, talked, and, and hung out together. They did a great job on it. Yeah. They also did, I think, a chant 13th hour, didn't they? Yeah, uh, they took on the, the more difficult ones of the cover songs, you know. Right. But they took it on, you know. It was great. Let's listen to it. Prehistoric Rhythm. So let's talk a little bit about when you and Lolly uh, first came to L.A., when you first mm-hmm. wanted to play on the Sunset Strip. Uh, tell the story about how they, they encouraged you to change your last name because they were Hispanic last names. Well, Johnny Rivers, he was about to leave and go to a new club called the Whiskey Go-Go. Uh-huh. And Bill Gazzari needed someone to replace him that actually could keep the crowd. They 
were always busy. The club scene at that time was really happening, and we went in for the audition. We were being managed by uh, Bumps Blackwell. You know who that is? Yeah, he worked with Little Richard, didn't he? Yes, he produced Little Richard, uh, Larry Williams, Ray Charles, uh, Rita Franklin, the Five Blind Boys, and Shorty Rogers. He discovered all these guys. He worked with the specialty records, too, right? Yes, right. He discovered all these artists. He also discovered Lolly Nye and brought us to Gazzari. And um, one of my grandfather's uncles was Vegas. It was Vegas, de la Vega. Mm -hmm. So we thought maybe we would just put a net on and call it Vegas. Because you guys were actually Vasquez, right? Yeah. But Vasquez was really important to me because to me, this is what it meant in the realm of things in the future. It's mm -hmm. called Vas, which is large and big, right? Right. V-A-S. And Q U, in other words, to, to let you know that it's easy mm -hmm. to be vast, you know what I'm saying, to right. be bigger than life. Right. But they pretty much told you that you had to change your name because Latinos couldn't play on the Strip at that time. There was no Hispanic playing on, on the Strip anywhere, on Sunset, on La Cienega, anywhere, nowhere. And um, it just wasn't happening. It wasn't permitted. Nobody wanted it. It was like a no-no. They didn't have black or Mexican or Indians or anything playing the script. So we came, so Bill Gazzari agreed. He said, just, he just call us Vegas, you know, the Vegas brothers. Right. He says, and, and you can start tomorrow night, you know. Yeah. And it was kind of the idea of Las Vegas too, right? Vegas. Yeah, right. So, so you know, party time. So, so we changed the name, and sure enough, we had a line two blocks down the street waiting to get in every night. Wow. You and your brother's ethnic heritage, of course, you got a lot of Mexican blood with the Vasquez, but you got Native American as well. Yeah, but we had Gene Pello with us on drums. Okay. You know who Gene Pello is, right? Yeah. He, uh, he took off and started playing with Michael Jackson on the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we also had Mike Kowalski with us, who played for the Beach Boys for the last 30 years. So Gazzari's was first and then the Haunted House? Gazzari was first on La Cienega, right? We went from uh, La Cienega to Sunset Strip. Because I was on uh, La Cienega Boulevard. And later it moved to the Sunset Strip. I played there in 68 and it was on the Sunset Strip. And La Cienega and Beverly is where it was. Because I was and then it moved to Sunset. So we opened that club for Bill Gazzari. We were there for almost five years. Wow. And from there we went to the Galaxy. Uh-huh. On Sunset, right next to the Whiskey. Yeah. I remember that. And then from there we went to, um, to the Purple Onion. And from the Purple Onion to PJ's. And from PJ to the carousel in uh, Downey, from the carousel we went to uh, the Haunted House. Yeah, you guys played there quite a long time. Yeah. No, but I was asking you about your heritage, because you have Mexican heritage, you have Native American heritage, but all, all Mexicans have Native American heritage as well. That's a fact, that's a fact. But here's the thing, though. It's called our manifest destiny. Right. You understand? Oh, what yeah. happened was they took away your Indian name and gave you a... a when they occupied me to give you a Spanish surname, like Vasquez, whatever it was, you know. But your Indian name was taken away from you, mm -hmm. so they wouldn't have to give you any land. Right. When the treaties were made, they had to assign a certain piece of land to all the natives, right? Uh -huh. But they didn't. They they only they handpicked the ones they wanted. And they, but uh, a lot of the, the Mexicans from Mexico that were actually Native American, Geronimo, you know. Their heritage was taken away from them, and they were given a Spanish surname. They came under the heading of Spanish, you know. Right, sure. That way they didn't have to give land to the people that were there, you know. But you and Lolly did have some Mexican heritage as well, right? Yes, absolutely. That was on my mother's side, and, and my dad my dad was full-blooded Indian, right? Mm -hmm. And my mom was half Native American and half Mexican. So she was a Morales, you know what I'm saying, Morales? Yeah, yeah. And my dad was Vasquez. But my name, my dad's real name is, back in the day was not Vasquez, you know. Mm -hmm. But in the roll call, when, when my dad did, was called to uh, sign the papers and all that, my great-grandfather, who was my, on my dad's side, was living in Arizona. He had, They had left the tribe because they had moved from the reservation because the dad needed to get to work, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, what happened was my great-grandfather who was also a Vasquez, they gave him the name Vasquez. He was staying on the Pima Reservation. Is that near Tucson? Yes. He was living with this woman on the Pima Reservation. <laughs> when the census was taken, he wasn't where he was supposed to be in, in Arizona, at the reservation there. He was on the Pima Reservation. Uh -huh. 
not the Yaki Reservation. Uh. See, my dad was on the Yaki Reservation. Yeah, because his father wasn't there, he never got to fill out the census papers, you know what I'm saying, for land, right? Yeah, huh? Being given land. So my, my great-grandfather was at, signed the census, but he signed it at the Pima Reservation. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that confused everybody, and, and <laughs> so they just wrote us off and they never gave us the land that we were supposed to be having. But I'm still fighting for that, Oh, good. by the way. Good. So the next song we're going to play is Nicky Hokey, and once again, it's written by uh, you, Lolly, and uh, Jim Ford, and that was also on the Redbone first album, 1970. Yeah. And there's a lot of Cajun talk in there, right? For sure. So that's the beginning of it. Yeah. That's what started it. Okay. Now, what does this mean, like where it says, uh, going to dig you on a, a Scooby-Doo, going to yeah. get you on a scuba die? You old bugaboo you. Yeah, ooh bugaboo you. Well, you have to figure that out. Get hip to the consultation of the Bula Wee. That's right. Bula Wigs. These are all real words that are using Cajun? That's right. That's real Cajun language. Yeah. And did you know that it's also in the dictionary now? Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, PJ Proby had a hit with that, didn't he? He had a big hit, yeah. Top five. And then Aretha did it, too? Aretha did it on the album Lady Soul. Check this out. What's his name? Uh, the guy that produced uh, Aretha Franklin at the time, right? Yeah. Called me up at 9 in the morning at home and said, Patty said, uh, we just recorded uh, Nicky Hokey with Aretha Franklin. We want it to be her next single. If you give us the publishing. <laughs> I said, well, I, well, I'll split it with you. He said, no, we want it all. I said, forget it. It's a good thing I said no. I could have said yes and gotten paid big at that moment, but I knew the song was going to be something more important. Yeah. You know? I didn't sell out. So she wound up recording it, but not as a single? It was an album cut? or what? Yes. So they, they told me, if you give us the publishing, it'll be her next single after Lady Show. I mean, uh, uh, Natural Woman, which would have made it number one in the world. I would have made money. A lot of it would have made money, but I would have had to give up the publishing, give up the ownership of the song, and I didn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Now, had PJ Proby already had a hit at that time with it, or was that late? Yes. Yes, he had already had the hit. Okay. That's incredible. To have somebody like Aretha do it, that's quite an honor. You know, it's pretty cool. Yeah, of course. And anybody in, anybody in their right mind would jump at that. <laughs> right. Have it as a single, but I was thinking more on, on the lines of the business. I was thinking, thinking more business sense. And it's a good thing I didn't because it's made me more money since. So you feel good about that decision even now? Well, yeah. Well, I had to make those kind of decisions. And I'm running the publishing company, and I, I can't just play everything, you know what I mean? I mean, I was willing to split it with them, but no, they, they wanted it all. P.J. Proby was a regular on the Shindig, right? Yes, he was. He, he was on that. What happened was he was on the, uh, the Dick Clark American Bandstand tour. He was the headliner. All throughout Europe and everything. He, he was sitting come uh, Nicky Hokey. I remember he had a ponytail, right? That was his look, long ponytail. Yeah, yeah. He, he used to remember those shoes he used to wear with the bow on it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> then he moved to England, and he made it big in England. Yeah, yeah, he was a monster in England. He was huge. The Beatles opened for him. That's how big he was. Yeah. Now, weren't you and Lolly guests on Shindig as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I've seen that clip. How was that? That was great, man. We were regulars with uh, Righteous Brothers, uh, uh, well, Little Richard. Uh, I think I saw a clip of you guys doing La Bamba on there. Didn't you do La Bamba? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. You guys were wearing suits. You still had short hair. Yeah. <laughs> Pre Redbone. We had the Pompadour, you mean? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Very 50s. Yeah. Let's listen to Nicky Hokey, man, all right? You got it. Check it out. Nicky Hokey to Tootsie on to the tire for Potami, okay? So, next up, I want to play a song that you guys recorded, also on your first album. And you wrote this by yourself, and it's called Chance to See. Oh, yeah. My God, I was stunned when I heard this because it is so jazzy, man. You guys sound like freaking weather reporters. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> what was going on with that? What gave you the idea to go so jazzy on that? It was um, something that I had heard in my head. You know, I heard it with a different way, and I'm really util- I wanted to utilize the uh, Leslie. Yes, yes. The Leslie speaker. I wanted to really, really use that big time. Now, had Lolly used it already at that point, or was that the first time Lolly used it on the guitar? Yeah, but we hadn't used it like we did on Kansas City. 
That solo Lolly Player in Kansas City is one of the greatest solos I've ever heard. It's, it's an, an amazing sound and, and the way it soars. Yeah. It's amazing. Incredible, I agree. Yeah, he played a great solo on that. Hey, do you remember, uh, Pat, when uh, when I uh, wrote that letter to Rolling Stone about, about Lolly, that they left him off the greatest... Uh, Hundred greatest guitar players, yeah, right? Yeah, and I wrote a yeah. letter to Rolling Stone, which they didn't publish, and then I published it on my website, and I printed it out and gave you a copy of it, and you played it for Lolly. And do you remember what Lolly said? No, I don't remember what he said. Well, you told me that. I said, well, what did he say? You said he took it like a man. He cried. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah, that's true. That's right. That's right. That's right. I remember now. Well, that touched me that the, the letter touched him, but it's just true. I mean, that list of the 100 greatest guitar players, there were some really bad guitar players on that list, and uh, yeah. Lolly belonged on it, so I wanted to... They, they, they seem to overlook uh, Native Americans in these. It was like, like, it was, it was like unsaid uh, written law that oh, you don't talk about Indians. You don't compliment them. You don't say anything nice. You don't wave a flag in their behalf. You know, you don't sing. Yeah. It was almost like a no-no in the business and everything. In some cases, it still exists, you know? But I'll tell you, uh, he played so great on that, there aren't many rock guitar players that could have done that, what he did on that record. Oh, no. See, Lala had a very unique style of playing. He played it like a piano, you know? He played, he played the strings with all four fingers, you know, like they do now. They're doing it a lot now in country. Yeah. But Lala was a, one of the first guitar players in rock and roll that played that way. Yeah. yeah. And Pete DePoe was playing some jazz chops on this record, too. Oh, absolutely. Pete was playing some, some incredible chops, you know. Incredible. He helped in my ability even further, you know. Yeah. Well, this track really proves that Redbone were really, really great musicians beyond what most pop and rock musicians can do. You know, this to me shows yeah. uh, you guys really played your asses off. You know? Thank you. So let's listen to it, man. Okay. Chance to see. So next up, Pat is I want to play Maggie but to be different everybody can hear Maggie online or whatever I happened to be at the uh, Amoeba record store a few months ago and I found this really rare Redbone CD and it was called Redbone Live I don't know if you, you probably remember it yeah you, you mean on Avenue Records yes yes that was the one album that we did for uh the Warner Brothers for uh, Avenue Records for Jerry Goldstein oh he and Linda Creed produced it. Well, it had a, a Corpus Christi, Texas concert. That was live. That was recorded live on stage. And then the other one was recorded in California, I think. Do you remember where the other... It was in Nashville, I think. Yeah, two different places. One of the things that blew my mind, though, is um, there was a person playing keyboard on, on this album that I recorded with years later. That was Gabe Katona. That's right. Gabe Katona. Yeah, I played with him, uh, when was it, let me think here, sometime in the early 80s, he was on a couple of sessions I did, great keyboard player, and so I was uh, surprised to see that he had played with you guys for a while. Yeah, he was with us for a while, Gabe was great, man, Yeah. Good and uh, anyway, so I decided to play the live Maggie from that live version most people haven't heard, and once again, Lolly's really stretching out on this, because it was live. Oh, yeah. But check this out. Guess where Maggie was originally cut, the original version that was released. It was cut at Sun Records in, in Memphis, Tennessee. I didn't know that. Same studio, Elvis Presley, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, and... Uh, Carl Perkins. Carl Perkins, uh, all these guys. Anyway, so we're going to hear the, the live version, which is really hot, and, and Lolly's really kicking butt on it. Now, he was the songwriter on this one, right? Yeah. And it was on the Potlatch album. Originally in 1970, but this live version was 1977. Uh -huh. And uh, Maggie hit the charts in 1971, got to number 45. Uh -huh. Oh, here it is. It says, uh, guess what? The other venue was Gazzari's. Oh, right. Corpus Christi and Gazzari's. Well, and the thing about Maggie, because I've played it with you, and that's, uh -huh. that song has really weird time signatures going on, right? Oh, yeah. It goes into 5 4. Dum, 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 da do Maggie. Yeah. Five, four, three, four. Yeah. That was tricky to play that. I know. And it was tricky to play some of Lolly's leads because he was playing <laughs> in this weird place, man. I had to find yeah. that, and I was able to, to get by on it. <laughs> it was fun, though, wasn't it? 
when you finally got it, it was fun. Oh, it's really fun because it's you're not yeah. used to playing there, and it works great. Yeah, it's a fun song to play. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows a uh, Maggie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And what's what's the idea of the song, Maggie? Well, Maggie was a bucking game. You know what I'm saying? She, we were working at the Red Velvet, and it used to be just beautiful, gorgeous, beautiful drop dead girl that used to walk in with jet black hair, beautiful milky skin, blue eyes, and a smile that would stop a freight train. I mean, just beautiful body. I mean, just gorgeous girl. And the name was Maggie. Ah. Everybody couldn't stop staring at her, and everybody hit on her. We saw that. <laughs> everybody hit on her. I mean, and she would get out there on the floor and dance by herself. <laughs> mm, just taunting everybody. Oh, man. Got it. Well, let's check it out. Live version of Maggie, 1977, a rare track. Here it is. Next up, we're going to hear a song you wrote, Pat, and it was also on the Potlatch album in 1970. And it's called Light as a Feather. Oh, yeah. That's an interesting song, and you got the wah-wah pedal going, right? Oh, yeah. I got, I got Tony loose on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Did he play the wah-wah? He played the wah-wah. Oh, very nice. And I cut him loose on that one. Uh, but the stop time, you know, the stop time was interesting, you know. And it had great harmony vocals, too. That was a big band arrangement. It was written for, for like eight. And I was saying a lot of good vocal harmony, three-part harmony and stuff. Oh, yeah. That's another thing about Redbone, you know, that you guys were not only great players and great writers and singers, but uh, you could harmonize. Not every band had good harmony, and you guys could harmonize. Yeah, but that's part of the, the work that we put into it. You know, we, we knew that you can't just be good at one thing. You have to be good overall. And we strived for that. We worked hard at it. We rehearsed night and day so that not only with our, our instrument playing and our so forth and so on, but, but that our vocals were also tight and coordinated with the music. So we used to put a lot of time into that. We wanted to be perfectionists. You know, we wanted to be perfect. We wanted it to be right, but yet to feel loose, you know? Right. Now, do you remember what uh, gave you the idea for the song or what the general thing was about? For Light and Feather? Yeah. Well, we went to New York to record uh, some tracks up there in New York, studios up in New York, and uh, we went to CBA Circus there. And while we were there, on our day off, we took a walk, and we walked uh, around New York, the streets of New York, you know? Mm. And we walked into this club called the Vanguard, really Vanguard. Wow. And when we walked in the door, we had a big announcement. This guy that was playing there introduced us because he recognized us, right? Uh-huh. And uh, he announced, uh, hey, hey, guess we just walked in. He says, we got Red Bull in the house, you know. And he introduced us. And I said, it was Chick Corea. Oh, wow. And he introduced us. And so we all got up on stage with him and jammed. We jammed like fucking crazy, man. We were cooking, boy. I mean, it was just an outrageous night. We were there till five in the morning. And uh, after that, I got the idea for Light as a Feather. Uh, And guess what? what? He came out with an album, too, called Light as a Feather. After the fact, huh? Yeah. Wow. So it was an experience, you know. Like I said, not a lot of rock bands could hang with guys like Chick Corea. Oh, I'm telling you, man. Chick was great, though, man. Yeah, Chick is a great musician, man. Monster. Man. A fucking genius, you know? Yeah. Well, let's listen to it, man. Let's listen to Light as a Feather. Okay. Enjoy. So, uh, Pat, you wrote a song also on Potlatch in 1970, and that's a song called Alcatraz. Right. Now, was that inspired by the uh, the occupation by the Native Americans? Absolutely, absolutely. See, we were on tour, and, and we heard the news over the loudspeaker. Some guy walks up on stage, one of the promoters, and said, the Native Americans, brothers and sisters, have just occupied it. Alcatraz, right? Mm-hmm. Announced it over the mic right before we performed, right before our performance. Mm-hmm. Very, uh, very heavy, you know, and, and very unique and a great thing in, in, in history, you know, that mm-hmm. needs to be told, you know. And there's all people that we knew, that we had hung with, you know, and mm-hmm. that partied with and that played with, you know, mm-hmm. the people that occupied it. So I felt I owed them that. And so did the song kind of tell the story of their occupation? Yes, it did, yes, it did. And the people that were there called us to make sure that we knew that they had heard it and that they appreciated it and they thanked me for doing that. Yeah. I love the harmonies and I love the, the chord changes and I love the, the guitar. I featured that. 
I looked it up and it said part of the idea of the occupation was it said that since Alcatraz Penitentiary had been closed on March 21st, 1963, and the island had been declared surplus federal property in 1964, a number of Native American activists felt the island qualified for a reclamation. They can get it back, right? That's right. We wanted to occupy and make it a Native American art museum, you know. Mm -hmm. But, of course, the bigger guy won. <laughs> of course, of course. It's a beautiful, a soulful song, so let's check it out, okay? All right. Alcatraz. Next up, Pat, is one of my favorites, and I used to love playing it with you, and that's Chant 13th Hour that you wrote. Oh, yeah. That's just that funky, that... Yeah. That rhythm there in that gig is something I put together. That was the most unique rhythm. Of, that's what really, really what Redbone was about, that rhythm. Yeah. You know, the way it was pieced together. I mentioned that the bass line, Tony's part, Lottie's part, and the drum part, everything was like a puzzle. Like I made it, it fit, yeah. you know. It was locked in. So funky, man. And yet, harmonically and harmoniously right. Yeah. And what's cool is it goes out of the funky. It's really, really funky. And then it goes into, give me just a little more time. Yeah, it goes yeah. into this other thing and then back into the funk. Yeah. And, and notice that the rhythm comes in as, a, as it doesn't come in on the one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Where's one? I know. It comes back in on the, on the, on the flow, you know. I like hit the ground running, you know. Yeah. 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 And I remember Pete told me that when you guys made the record, near the end, the beat went backwards. You know, sometimes the beat turns around. Yeah, yeah. Instead of two and four, it was like one and three. That's what Redbone was famous for. Yeah. The one was constantly moving. Yeah. So it would be going one way like this, and all of a sudden it'd be upside down. Right. And then it turned back around. And then turned back around, and some friends of ours, the Miami Sound Machine, have called me up and told me, hey, listen to this sound, Pat. Turn the beat around. Remember the song? Yeah. The Miami Sound Machine was talking about Red Bone, Turn the Beat Around, our thing. They were talking about 10, 13 Tower. Wow. Yeah. That's a very cool song. A lot of fun to play, too. Oh, it is, man. It is. Oh, and then it starts out with all those native chants, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is what I featured. If when I wrote it, this is what I was imagining, that there was uh, there's mountains on each side, a mountain over here and a mountain over there in the valley. Like the little big one, right? Yeah. So anyway, over here you heard the cavalry coming. That right? Yeah. You hear the drum marching, and you so you can see it coming and getting louder, and the cavalry's coming, right? Yeah. And on the right side over here on the other mountain, you hear the Indians singing, right? Uh huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're both on two different mountains coming to meet in the middle, right? Yeah. And then when they finally meet in the middle, that's when the music starts. And who did those chants? Did you have some people come in, or did you guys help? No, we did it. Wow. So I do the first one, then Lolly, then uh, Tony, and then Pete. Man, that sounds killer, man. Yeah. It came together, though, man. But that, it was a scene out of a movie. The cavalry marching on the left side, and the Native Americans on the right, on horseback, you know, chanting. And then they meet in the middle, and that's a little big one. That chant was like at least a minute, right, if not longer, at the beginning? Yeah, because uh, I saw it as a movie theme. I saw it as a movie, you know. Cinematic, like a visual. Yeah, yeah, that's how I visualized it, and that's how I did it. And that's how we did it, you know. Well, let's listen to that funky thing. Chant 13th Hour. Okay, you got it. Next up is uh, 1971, Witch Queen of New Orleans. You wrote this song, and it's got a hell of a lyric. It's been re-recorded about maybe 60, 70 times by other artists. And uh, it says Marie Marie Le Voodoo Vu, right? Marie Le Voodoo Vu. Voodoo Vu. What does it mean? Uh, Marie Le Vu, she dealt in voodoo and spiritualism. Mm -hmm. But her, her magic was called gold magic, white magic. Uh, she didn't cast evil spells. She uh, cast spells to heal you, to make you feel better. Real positive, you know, stuff. Like a good witch. Yeah, spells were very positive. I read a book about uh, Marie Le Vu that was published years ago. And I remember the Queen of England summoned her to the uh, castle. She summoned, summoned her and brought her to England to uh, help her with her decision in making her. They were about to go to war with France, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, she went to meet with the Queen of England and uh, the Queen Victoria. And uh, after their meeting, she was there for about two weeks. Then she came back to Louisiana and the war between France and England never happened. Wow. 
Marie Marie la voodoo vo. Yeah. Marie Marie la voodoo. And then uh, you use terms like zombie voodoo, gree gree, ton of leaves guaranteed to blow your mind. I'm the real stuff, and it's real. Yeah. That's the reality. That's the story. Funny thing is, I was asleep. I was in, in my bed. I was woke up in the middle of the night, and I laid all that lyric out in 15 minutes. It just came to you, huh? It just came to me. Yeah, but things like that happen to me. I feel I'm here for a purpose. I'm here because I'm supposed to be here, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure there's a higher purpose, and I'm not fighting it. I'm not waiting for it. I'm just being, you know. Yeah, well, that's a, it's a great song, Witch Queen of New Orleans. Yeah. Now, is it true that, uh, that Carlos Santana was going to record it at one time? Yes. As a matter of fact, my friend called me on the phone and said, I'm outside the studio, but Carlos just recorded it. The Witch Queen, right? Was it ever released? It was never released, but uh, he told me, I'm, I'm listening to it right now. I heard it. He was listening to it, but it was never released. That's their fault. <laughs> well, I could picture Santana doing that. It would work. Oh, yeah. Well, let's listen to it. Witch Queen of New Orleans. Next, we're going to play Message from a Drum. You wrote the song. It's from the Message from a Drum album in 1971. Tell me who gave you the idea for the song and what it's about. It's about family and some close relations, you know, close to you, you know, mm-hmm. that uh, talks behind your back and uh, in your face. They're really nice. I mean, they're, they're cool, you know, but when you're in company and they're looking to impress somebody, you got to shoot somebody to put down, you know. Yeah. And those are the kind of people, backstabbers, people that talk behind your back, but are right in your face and they come off like they're really, really your friend. And uh, they're not, you know. Yet it's a pretty song. And it's got some interesting time changes in it. Yeah. So let's check it out. Message from a drum. You got it. Next up is Jericho. Is that where you and Lolly grew up? Yeah, it was uh, the going on the west side of Fresno, you know. It seemed like everybody there uh, grew up in the different parts. They had all these different neighborhoods, you know. Yeah. And I worked for the Fresno Bee. I was, you know, I worked for the newspaper. I used to run messages between their editors and stuff. Then I said, I don't like this gay. I want a paper route. So I, I took a paper route. Uh-huh. They gave me the worst neighborhood in the city of Fresno to deliver the papers. In the lyric, it says something about uh, Jericho being very poor. Oh, very. You know, we were not wealthy at all, you know. We, Everybody had to work. It was a tough life. You know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, and I wasn't handed anything. I had to work for everything. And uh, there were nine of us kids and mom and dad, you know. Yeah. So it was hard work, you know, and, uh, and the neighborhood was a tough neighborhood. If you didn't stand up and, and walk the walk and talk the talk, you know, you'd get your ass kicked, you know. And uh, some people around there used to get their ass kicked every day. And, you know, you just don't live there unless you can handle yourself. But we learned how to fight. We learned how to take care of business, you know. Jericho was the local uh, neighborhood. And, uh, like, maybe a mile away was the city dump, mm-hmm. you know, where they used to go and unload everything and dump all the garbage from the day. You know. At night, they would burn it. We could smell it all the way in the neighborhood. A cloud of that smell would come over the neighborhood, and it was horrible, you know. Was Jericho the name of a city or a district? It was a neighborhood. Neighborhood. Yeah, it was like a little community, a poor side of town, I would say. Uh, city dump was like a mile away in the, in the slaughterhouse for all the different animals. We could hear the animals screaming out all the way to the house when they were slaughtering them, you know what I mean? So we had to live with that. And then on the other side of our house was uh, the Fresno Speedway, where J.C. Agajanian started as an entrepreneur, you know, on, with cars. He later on got the Indianapolis 500. But anyway, that's where it started, and I used to push the cars onto the track, you know, and get it for free and get free food, you know, popcorn, hot dogs, whatever. There's a line in the song that says, We Willie Young taught me to play guitar. Is that a real guy? Yeah, he was a blues but, You know, he played with uh, some very famous musicians, like we played with uh, the guy that sang uh, Pledging My Love. Johnny Ace. Uh, and Roscoe Gordon, he played with them. He used to sit and play blues of the songs. For example, one of the songs called uh, After Hours was recorded by Pee Wee Creighton. Mm-hmm. Funny thing is that she showed us a song, a toss a song that he recorded with Pee Wee. And 15 years later, we're in the studio re-recording that album with Pee Wee Creighton. How about that? That's cool, man. All right, let's check out the song. Yeah. 
Who sang this one? Together, we're singing together on it. Let's hear Jericho. This next one is one of my favorites. I used to love playing this with you. Wavoka. And that was written by you and Lolly on the Wavoka album, 1973. Was Wavoka a chief? Wavoka was a, was a uh, holy man. Yeah, he was. Uh, there's a movie that's supposedly coming out with uh, Wes Judy playing Wavoka. He was one of those big black hats that they wear with a, a large brim. He dressed like that, and he was uh, maybe five, 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 six. And he used to come. He would appear out of nowhere. People, and they knew a, a war was coming, and, and uh, he would put them together, and they would chant these chants and sing and dance, and uh, it, it didn't happen. You know, he just kind of like chased it away. The chorus of this song is cool, where it says, "Our people must dance, keep on dancing, keep on dancing. Our people must sing, keep on singing, keep on singing for the good times to come." That's what Volvoca said. That's what he talked to the tribes and the people, the natives. Now, what about that line, "Jin Ricky, Jinny Ricky, Jin Jin Jin"? Jin Ricky is a Chinese man. He's like a wizard. Jin Ricky Jin, he used to cast spells. He used to make things disappear and shit. I just put it into myself. Well, let's check it out, man. I love this song, Wavoka. Now, this next song is Heavy Man. We were all wounded at Wounded Knee. You wrote this song with Sandy Barron, the comedian. Yes, Sandy Barron. Sandy and I, we were on a flight back from Philadelphia. We had just sold out the Spectrum three shows. It was Redbone, Steve Miller, uh, Johnny Winter, and Edgar Winter, and uh, who else was there? Uh, Bad Company. We headlined the show, three shows. Sold out 27,000 people every show. And we were on our way back on, on the plane, flying back to L.A. And I was sitting uh, toward the front, and this guy comes over and sits next to me, and he introduces himself to Sandy Barron. And I said, hey, what's up? I watched you on your TV, had a TV show. And uh, he told me, listen, Pat, I wrote these lyrics. I mean, I got this idea for a song, and I would like to uh, show it to you, and maybe we can finish it together. So he didn't have any music, and, and uh, it wasn't all complete. It wasn't put together. He just had a big, long poem, right? And I had to tear it. I had to break it apart, put it into song form, you know. So anyway, I went up to his house, and uh, we wrote it in five days, and it was out in five days, and in five days it was the number one record in Europe. Didn't they leave it off the American album because it was too controversial? You know, it was banned in America. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I took it myself. CBS said, no, we don't want to touch it. Yeah. So I went into the CBS uh, pressing plant and had them print me uh, 500 copies that I paid for and uh, carried it under my arm. Yeah. Then we went to Europe and I took it to all the radio stations in Europe. Everywhere we went, I took it to the radio stations. That was the biggest selling record of that year and it was number one in every country in Europe. But it was banned in America. They wouldn't play it. That's pretty cool the way you made that happen yourself. Yeah, I had to. You know, I had a feeling about it. I mean, I was adamant about it because it was a true story, you know. It says, in the name of manifest destiny, broken treaties and promises. That's right. That's right. And to speak the truth in, in those days was dangerous, you know what I'm saying? We had the FBI and the CIA and everybody else. They had us in their eye, you know. And, uh, but we had to say what we had to do. We had the boss to do it, you know. They said to the guys, listen, we're going to have to cast our fate to the wind, man. We're going to have to say, fuck it. You know, fuck the fear, fuck the torpedoes. You know, we're going out there and we're going to do what we have to do. And we did it, and it's history. Fear does not matter in this case. You know, you can't have fear. you got to be willing to put your life on the line, you know. you got to man up, you know. Eventually, it was released on the Already Here album in 1972. Let's check it out. We were all wounded at Wounded Knee. Here's another one of my favorites, Clouds in My Sunshine. Yeah. Uh, let's see, you wrote that. It was on the Wavoka album, 1973. And it's just a cool melody, and uh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> what inspired this song? We, we were out there on the road in the, in the glory, and the audiences loved this. The kids, I mean, everybody just loved Redbone. At the same time, there was this cloud hanging over us, you know. This cloud of, of, of indifference and, and a smile in your face that made us feel very uncomfortable at times. We went ahead and did it anyway. 
damn the torpedoes, you know, we, we did it anyway. And I'm proud of the guys and proud of the group, you know, for doing what we what they did, you know. And and you know, we could travel cross country in the station wagon and people would look at us like we were from another planet, you know. But we hung in there and uh, we stuck together and uh, so we always had that cloud over us, you know. Because we were, we were always coming through with sunshine and smiles and, and good, having a good time, right? But they didn't know that deep inside I was feeling uh, indifference, you know. Yeah, I get it. Let's listen to it. Clouds in my sunshine. This next song is Beaded Dreams Through Turquoise Eyes. It's a beautiful song you wrote. It has a great lyric. It's got an electric sitar. It's got the diminished chords going on. It's got this Beatlesque groove. It kind of reminds me of George Harrison's Isn't It a Pity. What inspired this song? When we'd go to the reservations, the beginning we were playing in the longhouses, you know what they are. The longhouses where they have their meetings, their, their tribal meetings. Yeah. We would go there and perform. You know? And the longhouses, before the casinos came into play and their big, large auditoriums, you know, we were playing in the, in the longhouses. And I used to walk around on the res. I'd go to the res and I'd be out there. And I'd watch these ladies, these artists, super creative, beautiful artists, I mean, Native American artists, male and female, make these beaded photographs without a, any kind of a blueprint or any kind of a sketch, nothing. It all came right from their heads. And bead by bead, I watched them do this, one bead at a time, and, and, and it started, all of a sudden I started to see these pictures, you know, these beautiful things like you had just shot it with a camera. And it started with one bead, you know, and I was just amazed by that. So it inspired me to write bead of dreams for turquoise eyes. Because you've got to have turquoise eyes to see that. You had to see that far ahead and into the future. So turquoise eyes you can see you a lot further than most of us can. Your vocal is really cool, and it's got that little edge that you like. Yeah, thank you. Let me quote one of the lyrics here. It says, Love tightly woven together makes for a happier life where the earth meets the sky all around, all around. Time and space intertwine to the sounds we have found. Mountains of love bear the fruits of our lives. That's how it came about, you know. It's, that's what it did for me, you know. That's what I felt. I felt that all happening, you know, inside of me, you know, as I looked at it. Well, let's listen to... Be a dream through turquoise eyes. Okay, so now... Of course, we got to talk about Come and Get Your Love. It was your band's biggest hit. 1973, Wavoka album. Uh, went to number five in the U.S. Has the beautiful electric sitar on it by Lolly. Talk about the whole genesis of the song. Well, what happened was uh, Lolly called me up. Uh, you know, we had just gotten home from the road. And we had been out for three, four weeks. I took a couple of Valium. I said, I'm going to sleep good tonight. And just when I'm getting ready to get into bed, Lolly calls he says, hey, Pat, what's up, brother? And he says, and I'm getting ready to go to bed, Lolly. He says, oh, man, he says, I got this idea for this song, you know. And he was feeling good, feeling no pain, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. he says, I got this idea for this song. I said, Lolly, you know what time it is, don't you? And he says, yeah, man. He said, brother, but you've got to come check this out. I want, you, I want you to come and help me put it on tape, and I want you to help me finish it. And I said, Lolly, I'm not going to go down there and help you put it on tape and help you finish it. If I come down there, we're going to ride it together. It's going to be two riders, you and me, if I come down there and put the time into it. And he said, well, you know, you, I got to finish it. I just, you got to help me finish it. So I said, well, all right, I'll come down there, Lolly. So I did. I got dressed. Me and Liza Gonzalez, who uh, married a bass player from uh, Linda Ronsat's band. She was living with me at the time. So we went down there to Lolly's. Risha was there, and uh, Lolly was there, and, and his daughter. So I went to the music room, and we sat down, and I he played me what he had. And it was a song called, it had nothing to do with Come Get Your Love. It was a song called, I Want to Give You My Love. It said, uh, mm, I, mean, I want to give you my love. I want to give you my love, right? It's nothing like Come Get Your Love, the end result. It was a different song, but... I got the idea of what he was saying. And I started listening and listening. He had these changes, you know, that he was playing. And then he went off into some kind of another song, you know, to allow me to listen to this. So I put together a bass line, you know, the bass line's coming to love. Oh, yeah. I 
put together the whole pattern, right? Mm -hmm. And then I said, now let's fit the song to that. So I started taking away some of the... So now he wrote a song, he didn't write a song, he wrote a novel. It went on and on and on. And yeah. on all the albums, he did the same thing. He would write these long lyrics that would last six, seven minutes. So I'd have to break it down to a format, to a recording. Yeah. I had to yeah. do that with almost everything. And so what I did was I put the bass pattern together first, then we fit the song to it. Then we came up with it. Can we get up now? I took the meat mm -hmm. of what he was saying and put it into the song, the meat, you know, which is uh, mm -hmm. what he was saying, you know. He took the verses that were right yeah. and, and changed a couple of words here and there. So then uh, we recorded it on tape, and it was still, after all that editing I had done, it was still set at six minutes long. Wow. So that's the one that went on the album. Yeah. So, and I told him, Valerie, we have to cut it down to three minutes. We're going to get a record out of this. And he says, no, man, I'm going to leave it just like it is. So I said, all right. So he came out. He put it out as a single. It came out in the album. It bombed. Threw it in the garbage can. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. it was done. Then one night we're performing with Ronnie Millsap at the Whiskey Go-Go, right? Yeah. And guess what? Michael Atkinson, you know who that is? Mike Atkinson was the head promotion man for CBS Epic Columbia. Promotion mm -hmm. man. He was there at the show at the, at the Whiskey. And after our show, we're sitting down in the dressing room having a beer. And Mike Atkinson walks in with a drink in his hand. And he comes over and he kneels next to me on, on the chair. To me and he says, Pat, I need to talk to you. I said, sure, Mike. And he says, this is between me and you. I said, all right. He said, if you go in the studio and cut that record down under three minutes, I'll make you a top ten hit. That's exactly what he said to me. I'll make you a number one song. I promise you that. He said, if you cut it down for me. He says, because I believe that the hit is in there, but it's too long. Too many artists goes on and on and on, right? So I said, all right, Mike, do I have your word that if I go in and do it and bring it under three minutes, you'll make it a hit? He says, I promise you that. And that's Mike Atkinson, head of CBS promotion. So I went in that same night. I packed up my instrument, and I said, I'll see you guys later. I went downstairs, and I called Cy Mitchell, you know, the engineer. And uh, I told him the story. I told him what, I, what we had to do. And, I said, and he, said, he said, but I'm in bed. I said, I don't care. Get out of bed. We're going to do it tonight. So I talked him into it, and he, he got out of bed. Ina, his wife, was pissed at me. But anyway, he came down. We went to Wally Hyder's, and uh, we called up Wally Hyder on the phone. He came down, and we got the masters out of the uh, storage there at uh, Wally Hyder's. Went into Studio 4 on Selma Street in Hollywood, and I was in there with him till 8 o'clock the next morning. And we yeah. edited from six and a half minutes to 2.56. You know how much we had to yeah. do, I mean, to edit? Oh, yeah. Like editing in the old school way, cutting and splicing tape. That's right, that's right. And you had to know what you were doing. Now, right there, you got to cut. And boy, he would do it. They called him the blade. They didn't call him the blade for nothing. Anyway, and uh, so the next morning, we went and had breakfast afterwards, and we took the master to a uh, mastering lab that they're on, where Motown is, you know, on Sunset and Wilcox. We went there, and we went upstairs about 10.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I hadn't been in bed all night. We walked up and uh, gave him the master, and we need this baby cut hot, you know? <laughs> yeah. We knew how to cut him a little bit hotter than most, because uh, this guy was one of those guys that had experimenting with cutting. Uh, see, in Europe, they master 4 dB louder than they do here. Hotter, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why the, uh, the English record was so loud and so powerful, because they could master it maybe 5 or 6 dB hotter than the U.S., they weren't afraid to push the limit into the red. Yeah, they push it, and that's why you got the sound. Anyway, so I told him, I, you got to push this, you got to push it, you got to ride it, you know. I, I wanted it hot. So about 11.30, we had to finally mastered it the way we wanted it, the way I wanted it. Uh, I picked up the phone and called Lolly and said, Lolly, you got to come and hear this, man. So we finished uh, coming into that. We edited it and remastered it. So he came down, him and his research came down. And I said, all right, sit down, check this out. So we played it, played it through. It was six and a half minutes long. Now it was 2.56, right? We played it.
played it, and I just sat there listening, tapping his hand, you know, and, and after we finished, I said, what do you think? He says, I didn't hear anything different. <laughs> I said, you motherfucker. <laughs> after I worked all fucking night, right? That's, this is what I get from you, you fuck. <laughs> he just said, I don't hear anything different. You know, that takes a lot of nerve to say something like that, right? <laughs> I said, in that case, I said, you did a hell of a fucking editing job for him not to notice the difference. <laughs> he said, you did a masterful job, because if it was 656 and he didn't hear the difference, that was like a master's work. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> then I left the masters there, you know, so I said to Wally, send these immediately to New York. So he took the masters and sent them directly to New York. I never even touched them after that. I never even saw them after that. They were on their way to New York, and... Uh, the next day, I get a call from Mike Atkinson. He says, it's a hot off the press, Pat. He says, I'm going to keep my word. I promise you. So I said, all right, Michael. Love you, man. And he said, okay, I'll talk to you later. The rest is history. The record came out, hit the airwaves, and bam. And then you guys went into the next level of touring and gigs. Yeah, it took the group to the next level. Instead of those small venues, we were now headlining, you know, all the different the big, big, big concert halls, you know, 40,000, 100,000 people, you know. In New Jersey, we had 100,000 people short of, you know. And in Europe, too, right? Yeah, in Europe. I mean, everywhere we went, it was a lot of crowds, you know. And that night that I spent in there with Simon made the difference, man. I'm telling you, it just threw everything into orbit. In those days, they wouldn't play a record over three minutes. Uh, no, they wouldn't. But anyway, that's the story of Come Get Your Love. Fantastic, man. It wasn't easy, you know. I'm not one of these guys that gives up. Yeah. When I believe in something, I believe in it. It usually comes out soon. Well, let's hear it. Come and get your love. Is there anything else you'd like to say about Redbone? Well, I'd just like to say to everybody out there that Redbone was real. It wasn't a figment of your imagination, and it wasn't something that just happened. It took years of hard work and labor and years of dedication and uh, and knowledge. Like, there's a movie out right now that I'm in. It's called Rumble. And it's, it says Rumble, the natives who rock the world. And it's all the Native Americans that are now rocking the world, you know. And at the very end, the main guy that does the uh, interviewing and stuff, he said something really wonderful and something that I really appreciated. At the very end, he says, Redbone, come and get your love. He says, those guys did it the right way. He says, they had the appearance, they had the music tight, they had the arrangements, they had uh, everything about them was perfect. He said, and they won. You know, that's yeah. what he said, they won. And that's what it takes, you know. You have to have, everything has to be in place. You can't be weak in any area, yeah. you know. And that's what we did. We worked so hard to... Every every aspect of our performance and our music was perfection, you know. It had to be we had to be perfect. We couldn't afford any mistakes or any weaknesses. And that's why Redbone was a success. And I thank my brother Lolly Vegas and Tony Bellamy and uh, Peter Les Walking Bear Depot and Butch Rillera. I thank those guys from the bottom of my heart for uh, their contribution. Beautiful and well said. So, Pat, a couple of years ago, I was on your radio show. Thanks for reciprocating and being on mine. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Mark. You're a good man, and uh, I respect you, and I respected your father, and, and you know, you're good people. Well, thank you, and I had a good time the times I played with you in Redbone. And, uh... Yeah, we had fun, didn't we? Well, I'm coming up there to Thompson to have fun with you some more. <laughs> Let's do it, man. Just give me a call. Love you, Mark. Take care, bro. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. You've been listening to Mark Guerrero's Chicano Music Chronicles, produced and hosted by Mark Guerrero. Production and imaging by David Tyler. For further information on this program, visit www.chicanomusicchronicles.com. Thank you for listening.